We're going to read now from Colossians and chapter 2, and we're going to read from verse 20. Colossians and chapter 2, and reading from verse 20. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why is, though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will, worship, and humility, and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh, or no value against the indulgence of the flesh, maybe we could say. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free. But Christ is all and in all. May God bless to us what we have read this evening. <clears throat> We've tried to discern his greatness. We've tried to declare his greatness. We've tried to defend his greatness. And in this section, and, and we're going to try now to just see devotion to his greatness. It's going to touch our minds. It's going to touch our hearts. But there's something that's running behind this that I'm going to take time to try to explain. In as much as I attempt, I hope to attempt with all of my with all of my mind and God's help, and in as much as I fail, you'll forgive me. But have you ever noticed that sometimes there are words, the same words, and you, you, have, a, you have an idea that maybe they sometimes apply one way, sometimes in another way, another time, and, and you're just wondering, am I missing something? Am I confusing things together? And so I'll just take you this then. To, just follow with me. Go to chapter 2, and you're looking at verse 13. And it says, Being dead in your sins, have he quickened together. Oh, right, you've got it. Being dead. So you're, you're being dead in your sins. Then you go to verse 20. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ. Oh, I thought I was made alive. It said in verse 13, dead in your sins, quickened or made alive together. Now it's saying, if you be dead with Christ. Oh, I'm dead with Christ. But then in verse three, chapter one, uh, chapter three, verse one, if you be risen with Christ. Oh, now here I'm risen. And then in verse three, it says, for ye are dead. Oh, I'm dead. And then being dead, being alive, being dead, risen, being dead. And then in verse five, it says, put to death. I hope you're just like me and ready to say, I don't get it. Do you get it? W would you understand that maybe something's going on here that you need a little extra information for whenever you would go to, uh, we, don't, we don't see it so much now, but you would come along to a large factory and, and what they would do, maybe even of a small factory, but what they would do is they would take garments or or sheets or cloth or whatever it is and they would dye them different colors 
Uh, and you can do this in your own home, in your own kitchen, if you like. And uh, it used to be very popular back in the 1980s to wear to school something that we called tie-dyed shirts. And you would tie a shirt in knots and you would dip it in the dye. And then you would wear it the next day. And of course, it would just be a specimen of beauty. It looked an absolute sight. But we thought it looked great. And, and so you know what dyeing is, right? So, so you come along and you're just sitting there with your eyes closed. And the person beside you looks up at the factory and sees the slogan. And looking at that slogan, they, they read it out to you. So you might not really know much about, uh, about the place. but And it says this. We live to die and die to live. The more we live, the more we die. And the more we die, the better we live. You'd say, pardon? What am I missing? It makes perfect sense if you know that die is spelt D-Y-E on the side of the building. And it makes no sense whatsoever if it says D-I-E. And sometimes I wonder if we don't really sometimes know the difference when we just read things. And we can get ourselves all tied up in knots because we just don't get it. What do you mean? Die. But you're alive. What do you mean? You have died, but you're risen again. And what does it mean? Put to death. Because it seems like it's all confused and all mixed up, doesn't it? And you wonder, why can't the Bible just be so simple? Have you ever wondered that? Why doesn't Paul sit down and say, here are the 15 points that I want you to memorize. Here are the things that I want you to know. Well, for one thing, I'll tell you this. He is speaking about great truths. He's speaking about the Savior himself. And if you were to come to me and say, I just want you to tell me the 15 words that describe your wife and give me a complete and a total detailed account that would totally exhaust her and her character and everything. 15 words. Do you think I could do it? You think I could do it? Well, I'm told here in Scotland, you're not supposed to praise your wife. So I won't bother. But you see, coming from North America, we have to say marvelous, wonderful, glorious. And those are the first three words that describe my wife. <laughs> but you would understand when we are dealing with a person, it's not just that we're going to come to some sort of uh, equation and you've got your A and your B and your C. Paul is painting marvelous word pictures of Christ and what he has done. And when you're speaking about a person, you can never exhaust him. And so what we're getting is letters that are just laced with, with all sorts of things. And these things are and our, our desires. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'll tell you a little story. So just give us one aspect. You would know. We've heard it in the gospel. So you would know what it is whenever a lady is brought into the court. Rather you know, not so old, but not so young lady. And she was brought in before the courts because she has committed a traffic violation. Now, I know none of the ladies here would be guilty of such, but they look up and they say that the judge is her son. And they're all saying, what's he going to do with her? What's he going to do with her? Will he out of love say, mom, <laughs> away you go. Or will he be a hard-nosed judge? And will he bring down the letter of the law? And what will he do? And you know how we tell it in the gospel. You know exactly what the judge does. Being a son that was brought up right by his mother, he hands down the full force of the law and sentences her to quite a fine. Oh, a gasp goes across the court. How can he? Where's love? Oh, you'll see it now as he gets down off the bench himself and he goes to the cashier at the entrance of the courthouse and he pays the fine that he has just given to his mother. Oh, you breathe a sigh of relief. You say, wouldn't it be good? Wouldn't it be good to have a son like that? Well, I'm sure it would be. But friend, you've got a savior like that. 
There's a God in heaven like that. Who looks down at you and in his righteous holiness, he is able to pronounce you guilty to the full extent of his holiness. And then God in mercy sent his son to a world by sin undone. Where did he send him? Sent him to the place where the price would be paid. Sent him to the place where that ransom would be, would be paid. And, and the Lord Jesus Christ pays it in full so that we have the, the righteousness of God maintained. And, and we, also have, we also have the love of God being able to be extended. You say, that's good. That's good. What does it have to do with me? Oh, everything. You see where we are? The Bible describes us as being dead in sins. Dead in sins and in trespasses. Chapter 2, verse 13, dead in your sins. That's where you are. Let's draw a big circle here. This is a position. This is a position of every unregenerate, every person that has sinned and has not been forgiven. This is a big circle here, and in it are all the sinners, and they're dead in sins. Now, mind you, they can walk. They walk according to the course of this world. They're able to, they commit all sorts of acts and deeds. So, so this deadness, this is just that there's no response in their heart to God. They're just like they're dead. God can speak. There's no response. God can command. There's no obedience. They're dead. So you draw a big circle there, say, in fact, in Colossians chapter 1, what was it called? The power of darkness. And there it is. Big position there, dead. But because a ransom price was paid by the Lord Jesus on the cross, when the sinner repents of his sin and believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, they are translated from the power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Draw another circle. There's another circle, another position. Dead in sins. Now they are alive. They have eternal life in Christ, in Christ. And the great marvel to my soul is that once in Christ, you're in, you're in Christ forever. You can't be removed from this position. Oh, that's when, oh, that's when I just love the word predestination you know god predestinates and he will never fail in that every single one of these ones are going to be placed as sons they're going to be placed in the kingdom of his glory they're going they're already in the kingdom so you see you're dead in sins you're alive in christ and so sometimes when you're reading your bible when you read about the death the deadness and then the life it's just a positional truth based on what christ has done to pay for our release that's what redemption means he has paid the ransom price to redeem us back to god he's the great redeemer so i'm trying to get my venn diagram all properly done here where you've got a, a circle here dead in sins alive in Christ, a price paid so that that can be accomplished. And then you ask yourself, oh, that was good. Now I can get on with life. I can just live whatever way I want, right? It's guaranteed, isn't it? It's guaranteed. So now I just go right back to my idol's temple for the barbecue. Sorry, for meat offered to idols. Now I can just go right back to all my old things that I used to do because it doesn't matter, does it? He prayed, paid the price. I am no longer dead in sins. I am alive in Christ. I'm in Christ forever. And that's it. I can go right back to the way I was living. It makes no difference. I, I hope every single one of you right now that is born again by the Spirit of God say that doesn't even smell right. That doesn't seem right to me. Seems awful wrong. Well, so, so it is. You say, is, is there more to this story then? Is there something else? Is there something else I should know that will help me live? Oh, yes, there's something else, all right. 
Let me tell you another story. And this one I got from my good friend, Norman Crawford. And I just delighted in chatting with him because he used to go into the prisons. And actually, in going into some of the prisons, he went into a maximum security prison. And in dealing with one particular man, the man on death row, because they still do execute in the United States and some of the states, the man on death row trusted the Savior. Do you really think the death of the Lord Jesus can cover a man like that? <laughs> Without a doubt. Do you know what breaks my heart? When I go door to door in Northern Ireland, I will have men that will look at me. And I can tell by the flags they're flying. I know exactly what they, do, what they are. He says, um, this Jesus that you're preaching, is it forgiveness of sins through him? Yes. He says, and naming a notorious I don't want to sh show what side I'm on here. A notorious terrorist figure. He said, if he, naming him by name, believes on Jesus Christ, will he be forgiven? I said, and naming the man by name, the terrorist by name. I said, if he repents of his sin and believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, he'll be saved. Does that mean he'll be in heaven? I said, for all eternity. He says, well, then you leave my property right now. I will not believe in your Jesus that will forgive a man like that. Do we know the scope of the death of Christ? Do we really have an understanding? I tell you, it was impressed upon me that day. It was repulsive to that man on his doorstep that there could be one who could have died an awful death, the death of the cross, to even save a Northern Irish terrorist. I've broken bread with terrorists. They were from a different country, not Northern Ireland. I can take you to an assembly in Venezuela where there's a man who murdered four people. And he spent 25 years in jail for it. And when he got out, he heard the message of the gospel, trusted Christ, was baptized and added to the assembly. I don't know how that makes you feel. But I just bowed my, bow my head and thank God, such is the death of Christ. Well, this man on death row got saved. Mr. Crawford would come in and visit him. He was in Christ, but he was still in jail. And so Mr. Crawford would leave and he would go through all the different doors of that maximum security and the warden would see him out. And that was it. Another visit, you get through all the doors. He would see the, his brother in Christ. It's only another week now. I'll be on the electric chair. And then came the day when the warden phoned Mr. Crawford and said, so-and-so is free to go. Free to go. Yes, he's free to go. The maximum penalty of the law has been executed on that man. And he was kept in that maximum security prison until the high voltage went through the chair. And when he was dead, he was free to go. And so in went Mr. Crawford for the body. And he takes the man out of the maximum security prison. He's free to go. But unfortunately, in my story, he remains dead. What if they got to the gates and they got into the, put him into the back of the car. And as they were driving away, what if they stopped at the next lay-by? And Mr. Crawford said to him, get up. And the man got up. What do you think would happen? Oh, you say, the police would come and arrest him. No, they couldn't. He's now at perfect liberty to live. The law can ask no more of him because he died. But you know in my story that the man stayed dead. But what if, what if we could tell a story where, where 
the person who was condemned to die actually died, was removed out of that place of bondage, and then stood up and then was able to live and able to live in society again. You say, that, that would be incredible. Can I tell you that that's just a feeble story, a feeble picture? But that's also what the death of Christ has done. Because God says, I want to tell you what I think about what happened at the cross. And then I want you to think what I'm thinking. Here's what I think, says God. When Christ died there, you died. Christ didn't just pay the ransom. That was a wonderful part of the picture. A ransom to take you from dead in sins to alive in Christ. When my son died, he was a representative. In fact, put it this way. You died with Christ. That you died. You say, does that make any difference? Go back to my story if you don't mind. Make any difference. This means because you've died, you get to come out from underneath all those requirements you couldn't keep. The law. You're released from that, but the glory, the glory of my wonderful, true story now is that you didn't just die with Christ, you rose again with Christ. You are now alive. And when he died, you died. This is God's reckoning. This is God's considering. He says, this is what I'm thinking. And he says, now I want you to take my thinking and make it your own. I want you to understand when Christ died, you died. And when Christ rose again in newness of life, you rose again in newness of life. You say, well, what does that do? Oh, I tell you, it affects everything. Because if Mr. Crawford was able to get that murderer alive again, he could have lived in, in a newness of life. He, he could have been doing something right. He's been liberated. When he was locked up, he couldn't do anything. Now he can produce something. And I tell you what Christ did. When God reckons me to have died, that, mean, that means that all this trying to be saved and all, this, all these things that we've been reading about in Colossians, all this handwriting of ordinances and all these new moons and holy days and then we come down to verse 20 what, what we're at the rudiments of the world and and ordinances whether they be pagan or whether they be mixed up with jewish it hardly matters all of these things that people were doing trying to get saved it was like our friend in the maximum security he was jumping up and down trying to get over a wall he could never go over he was pounding his fist against a door that would never open. He's locked in. He's, he's locked up. He can't get out. There's no way in his own efforts. Now, now says God, he says, I want you to understand no efforts of your own would have ever done it. But because I've reckoned you now to have died and made alive, now you can live. You're free to go, brother. You don't have to try to be saved. You don't have to try to adopt all sorts of Jewish rituals or worship of angels or, or any other thing. You've got Christ. And you're now free to live for him. Oh, you say, well, that sounds very practical. Oh, it is. If Christ dying for us is a ransom paid, and it's a positional truth of taking us from that kingdom, uh, that darkness, the power of darkness, dead in sins, and making us alive in Christ. And that's what he has done. He's paid a price to do that. That's all positional. I tell you, there's a great practical outworking in understanding that at the cross, I died. You might ask, well, what did you die to? I died to sin. I'm not going back to that. I'm not going back to be characterized by the things that held me in bondage. In fact, I'm alive in Christ. God has made, God reckons me to be that, so I'm going to reckon it too. I'm going to live like it. I think it was Mr. Jim Allen in his quaint way uh, that he had, that he had, he says, 
well, and I'm going to have to update it because he spoke of it as being a millionaire, but I mean, everyone's a millionaire nowadays. So we'll have to up the ante a little bit. And, and what a billionaire, billionaires, they're not so common here. Maybe they are in Perth, but not where I am. And uh, we have a billionaire and suddenly you find from the inheritance, it comes in, the lawyer's letter comes in and says, your great uncle Cecil Hercules uh, McGillicuddy has died and he's left everything to you. And then there's a billion pounds in the bank for you. And what Mr. Allen says, he says, you leave the lawyer's office, he says. You leave the banger at the curb and you go straight down to the Tesla dealership or whatever your favorite cheap car is, whatever it is. Right. You say, I'm leaving that. You see that? You see that little Chevy there? I'm leaving a bit. Why? Because from now on, I'm going to live like a millionaire. Sorry, a billionaire. From now on, I'm going to live like it. I'm not going back to the old ways of, of just of having a little bit of bread and butter, a bit of toast maybe, and a little cup of tea, and that's all that there is, a bit of butter and, and a bit of water, and, and then there's not much in, in the larder. And I'm not going back to those ways. I'm going to live like a billionaire. Well, what a feeble picture that is. You've made him made alive in Christ Jesus. Brethren and sisters, we're not going back. We're not going back to those deeds that were associated with what we were. We're not going back to all that living for the flesh. We aim to please the Lord Jesus with all of our hearts, with all of our energies, and to love the Lord our God with every faculty that we have. Because God has reckoned us to be his children. God has reckoned us to be heirs. God has reckoned us to be sons. God has reckoned us to be alive. He rose again in Christ. If that's what God thinks, then it's high time we thought it too. And began to behave like a child of the king. So often it's told, I think it's very relevant. When Alexander the Great had to bring one of his corporals in who had been misbehaving. He says to him, here's your crime. I, what's your name? And the cheeky corporal said, my name's Alexander. And Alexander the Great says, either change your name or change your behavior. And if we be Christ's and we be Christians, we have no right, we have no right to behave in a way that shames his holy name. No license to behave in a way that is, doesn't demonstrate each and every day that we're a child of the king. Well, let's go now to our verses, shall we? That was a lovely preamble of 40 minutes. So you know this meeting is for eternity. So we'll keep on going. I know there's people that need to leave and our hearts go with them and their sorrow. But uh, let's go to our verses now. Verse 20. Wherefore? If ye have died with Christ from the rudiments of the world. This is that second story we're talking about, isn't it? This is a person that has died with Christ by God's reckoning. From the rudiments of the world, from all of these elementary things that we suggested to you could have even been like the gods that are in the stone in the air and such like all these fearful things. Don't. If you be dead with Christ from all of those things, why, living here in this world, would you be submitting yourself to all sorts of rules to be saved? And then he makes a little rhyme up, touch not, taste not, handle not. Maybe that's what some of the ones were saying. Maybe, oh, you can't do that. You can't do this. You can't. You've got to be doing all of these rules and regulations to do with meats, to do with things you can touch or taste or you notice it says, which are all to perish with the using. I think that's, that's just an understanding of what the Lord said about the things that um, go into a man, don't defile him. No, if, if you do eat and it does go into you, it does perish with the using. Do I have to say any more? It, it's gone. And then out into the draft. And the Lord said that. He says, it's not what goes into a man that defiles him. It's what comes out of a man that defiles him. And that which comes out of the heart and all of these different sins. So he says, which are all to perish with the using, he says. 
all these commandments and doctrines of men, people have devised all sorts of schemes. They're in that place of deadness. He says, look, you've died to that. You've died to that. That's, that's nothing to you. You're not going to respond to that anymore. Dead bodies don't respond. He says, you've died with Christ. God has reckoned you that. Now you reckon it. And don't you be going to any of these things. They actually are a bit of a show of the flesh. And in verse, verse 23, indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and a false humility. And oh, look what I'm doing. And it says, they have no value against the indulgence of the flesh. People that are trying to be stoic and people that are trying to make up rules. I've even noticed this about Christians. Legalistic Christians make up all sorts of things. I find that they fall into sin just as much as anyone else. It's a sad thing. It's not rules from the outside. It's life from the inside that changes. So then, if then you be risen with Christ, chapter 3, verse 1, so we've died with Christ, so we're not going to respond to all that which men make up. We're dead. No response. But he says, now you're alive. You're risen with Christ. He says, right. If you're risen with Christ, he says, where's your focus to be? He says, you remember Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Now I'll just say this. You have a choice. You have a choice. This is how God reckons you, but God still gives you the responsibility. God still has in you as a Christian choices to make. We live in the real world. We're going to be making choices. And so he says, here's your number one choice. Set your affection, set your mind on things above, not on the things on the earth. I tell you, brethren, this is a choice. This is where we submit our will to his will. This is where we set our affection, our devotion, our mind, our heart, our might. We set it on Christ. You say, I'm finished with all this. You see all these, you see all this world that's just a cesspool of iniquity. I'm not going to be diving into it anymore. I left it behind. I'm dead to it. I'm alive to Christ. I tell you, it would be a tremendous thing if we actually would know that in God's reckoning, you're free, you're at liberty to finally respond and to serve me. You've been made that way. I've reckoned you that way. So do you reckon yourself that way? Where your heart is? Or is it where your treasure is? There shall your heart be also. He says, is that your treasure? Is Christ your treasure? Oh, you say, I'm deeply thankful for what he's done in paying the ransom. Yes, so am I. But he hasn't just guaranteed a future. He has actually given you life in the present. And to be a Christian, that's why he's left us here. It's so that we can enjoy this present power, this present life of Christ. And so we're to set our affection. This is where it all starts. I would understand there's, there's a lot that goes on in various airplanes. I'm usually sitting in somewhere around 62C, which is just behind the laboratories at the back of the plane. And it's just way, way at the back. And you just tuck yourself in a corner. Being my size, you can sleep in economy, no problem, and uh, stretch out even in a seat. And so there you are. And that, But I understand there's more going on. And I wake up and I've arrived at my destination. Thank everybody for all the work they've done. Give a nod to the passenger that I haven't talked to just too much. And, uh, and off I go. But I really, I know, I know everything really was depending on what was going on in the cockpit. The direction we were going, the progress we were making was all going on right there up at the front. I just wonder, brethren and sisters, if we understand the importance of having a heart that is focused 
set. Out of love to Christ, out of love for Christ. And you would understand, seated on the right hand of God means it's just, it's not only his person, but it's his entire work of redemption. It's everything. When he's seated on the right hand of God, it's a little expression that just means all that he is and all that he's done. And because he's seated there, it includes all that he yet will do. And so I rejoice in this, and so do you. Now set your affection. For ye are dead. Oh, dear, we're back to that again. Yes. You've died. Remember, he's just reminding you. You died with Christ. Oh, you're alive. Your life is hid with Christ in God. But ye are dead. You say, what? Why is he emphasizing this? Well, he's emphasizing it so that you and I would understand why we don't do certain things. I was almost amused. In fact, it takes very little sometimes to amuse me, perhaps. But I I found it very interesting when a couple of sisters were invited to a party. Now, after a while, they stop inviting you because there's nothing worse than having a Christian party. It really puts a damper on things. With the guy. in the in some of the in-between Ooh, stages, the people don't know you well enough. They invite you to a party. And these two sisters decided they would write uh, a little reply. And they wrote back and said, we are sorry. We cannot attend your party because we're dead. Now, while that uh, may have been lost on the host, I thought it was a good principle. Or I thought it was a good example. They had an understanding. We're dead to all that. We're not coming because we're dead. Uh, Can I just say to younger believers, when you are faced with a lot of decisions, older believers have had to face them before and they've already got their hearts set. Their 747 of a life has been on track for a good wee while now, but you're just on the taxiway and you're maybe getting in the takeoff zone and you're, you're making some of these decisions and you've got radio control coming in from all angles. You just remember, I'm not responding to this world because I'm dead. That's what God sees me as, and that's what I'm going to see myself as. The trouble is, is that we're not dead enough. (laughs) Quite often, we're not dead enough. That's why we're not alive enough. And now I think you're beginning to get the picture. I hope you would understand. No, No one out there in the street would understand that. But I think you would, wouldn't you? We're not dead enough, therefore we're not alive enough. My brother was telling me about this this morning, and so I'm sharing that with you. So he says, Christ, who is our life, shall appear, will appear with him in glory. Oh, what a glorious future. You know what that helps me do? That helps just just ease a little bit of the sorrow for now. That maybe I'll be able to consider it just these present sufferings or but just a light affliction. It'll help me to make present day decisions that will deny. And let me tell you this. Can I, can I just be gentle on this? There sometimes is leaking into our theology this idea that if you give up something for God, that he will reward you in kind. So therefore, if you give up that promotion at work for the sake of the assembly, that somehow God will double your income by giving you a better job. And since we all know examples where that happens, we think that that is God's way of working. Do you know what sacrifice is? It means it's gone. You've laid it on the altar for God. Now God will reward you in a coming day, in positions and in administrative positions in the kingdom which is to come. You will be acknowledged, but do not think that you will be acknowledged here. And if you don't go drinking in the grad bar with your professors, you will miss out on the scholarships. I don't know if they have so many over here, but you will miss out and you will not get them. God will make sure you have bread and butter on the table, but all I can say is you will miss. If you give up something for the Lord, sometimes he says, well, that's for me, and it's a sacrifice. And so there are some sisters that have turned to young men that are not living for God, and they are saying, I am no longer dating you. I will not marry you because your heart is not for God. And they've remained single to this day. You see, I thought because they honored the Lord, they would be given something else. Not necessarily. God is not someone that you turn to and give him a little 
so that he gives you much. I think this prosperity gospel that has been coming flying over in bushel loads from America, Canada, it's getting into our way of thinking. Look, our reward is with him in glory. That's where we will enjoy it. And so please, don't put yourself into mental anguish. There are things that you give up for the Lord, and that's that. It's for him. You've done it. And he's taken every bit of note of it. Well, with that in view, understanding I'm dead, my life is hid with Christ in God, there's a great future and all that, I'm still right here on earth. Now he says, you put to death your members which are upon earth. There are things that you've got to guard against you. There are things that you've got to be dealing with. Look at them. Fornication. Those are illicit relationships. Impurity, that's uncleanness. The evil, the jesting, the pornography, the filthy novels, the impure movies. The, it says inordinate affection. These are the, the passions. The evil desires, the lust, this concupiscence, you can just translate it lusts or desires. Covetous, those are wanting things. It's like idolatry. Yeah, it is idolatry. It's displacing Christ. He says, look, you're going to have to put to death your members. I don't know what else to do with the flesh, but the Bible knows, and the Bible says crucify it. You can't change it. Flee youthful lust, Timothy. Oh, but Timothy is a, a great man of God. Flee youthful lust, Timothy. My brother, my sister, none of us are home in heaven yet. And the flesh is still with us to the very end. And it can take evil forms such as this. And anything that would displace the Lord Jesus in our lives, it's, and we want, and we desire, and we covet. It's idolatry. What, is the la what are the last words of 1 John? After that lovely epistle of love, and lovely epistle of light, and marvelous things concerning the Savior, and, and the brethren, and, and it says, little children, that's not immature. Seven times over, you get that little children. That's not the word for immature. That's, that's just the relationship there. It's little children. It's all you believers. It includes the old men. It includes the young men. It includes the, the little ones. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Do you know what shocks me? It shocked me when I moved back to the UK. And I saw the materialism all around me of all my, all the peers that were my age. And suddenly I wanted it. When I was in Tokyo, I didn't want it. When I was in Sapporo, I didn't want it. And I came back and saw all the spiritual brothers and sisters and everything that they had. And I thought, is that what I gave up? I really want it. I tell you, I had to get before the Lord. Oh, it just raises. It's the flesh, brethren and sisters. It's the flesh. Covetousness. Paul said he didn't know what to do with it. It's, it's what slew him. Covetousness. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For the love of the Father is not in them. These are very solemn things. I speak to my own heart. I put myself right in that seat with you and let the word of God penetrate my soul. I'm dead. I'm alive. Therefore, I'm just going to put to death. No. Not that. Not giving that one ounce of wriggle room. For the things which sing's sake, the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. God is, you see how in verse 4, there was the, there was the appearing with him in glory. That's our future. You see in verse 6, the children of disobedience, they also have a future. The wrath of God cometh upon them. And look what you used to be among them, in the which ye also walked at one time when ye lived in them. The thing is now you're dead. You're not living in them anymore. You're not indulging. These pagan Colossians, believe, uh, they were believers now, but when they were pagans, they didn't even have a law to keep them hemmed in. They just, unbridled lust was just taken for granted. 
and living in a country where I had for a good while. While they make it all beautiful on the outside, let me tell you, it was nothing but unbridled lust all through in the warp and the woof of the society. He says, well, he says, we are dead to all that. Now he says, now you Christians, verse 8, you Christians just take note of something here. Make sure that you understand that there's some more things that maybe maybe you're going to mortify your members on, on these other things. But you see, you see, you need to take off. It always reminds me of Lazarus's grave clothes a little bit. He was alive all right, but he was still wrapped up. He just needed a bit of help to get unwound so that he could get going again. He says, now you put off all these. And I speak to every man here. Anger? Wrath? Got a bit of bitterness? A little bit of, you'd like to get the brethren sometimes, just to trip them up? Blasphemy? Filthy communication out of your mouth? This morning I spoke directly to the sisters. I'm going to speak directly to the brethren. These things are more likely to be characteristic of males. So can I speak to you? Elders are not to be given to having a, a temper. None of us are. Are we giving our, are we allowing these things that the people of the world would have? Do we get soon angry? Do we have a burning wrath in us at times and a bitterness? He even says blasphemy. I wouldn't think anyone here would be like that. Filthy communications out of your mouths. Lying not one to another. This is all coming out of the mouths. Now, I don't know that anyone here would want to be guilty of lying. Why did Paul tell believers not to lie? Brethren and sisters, when I catch a believer lying, it breaks my heart. Because I do catch them lying. I just leave that to you men, especially. It's high time we realize that having a temper or expressing anger will step right into the home. Isn't that where we usually express our feelings the most? My heart condemns me. This is where, this is where we really need to have our hearts set on Christ. Your wife will see it. Do you know what I love to hear sometimes is whenever I hear a wife speak about her husband and they say, you know, he used to have a problem. But now I don't see much of that anymore. The man has grown. He's learned to control himself. He's learned to conquer himself. I wish... I wish that I'd heard ministry that used the word conquer yourself. Maybe I did and wasn't listening. So I'm using it for you tonight. Learn to conquer yourself. Put on the new man. Oh, there's a renewing in knowledge after the image of him that created him. I don't have time now to develop this much, but I'll just say this. God does when you fasten your you fasten your affection on him. There is that energizing, renewing, sanctifying effect of the Holy Spirit that as you know, you will grow. You'll grow after the image of him that created him. You, you've been, you have now been made to rise again in Christ and with Christ rather. And, and, and God sees you, but he's given you the energizing, the sanctifying effect of the, of the Holy Spirit himself. And so we can look to him for help. And you know, it's, it just does away a lot with all of these, whether you're this nation or that nation or this religion or that religion. It says either barbarian, Scythian, bond or free. It, all these things, he says, really, really, it's all about Christ. Being a Christian is all about Christ. So on that note, I'll close.
But there might be some of us here that need to have a fresh determination before God that you tonight will get down beside your bed and you will set your affection on things above. Oh, you've had it there before, but it's begun to wane. You've had it there before. You set, you set the compass tonight. You get down before God and you make your confession and you do so in tears. And you say, I'm alive in Christ. It's him. <laughs>